Would you take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Jeremiah? Jeremiah 31. Might we get this mic a little stronger? Thank you. I'm getting over a cold, so my, my voice won't be quite as strong today. Thank you. Jeremiah 31, verse 31. And would you rise out of reverence for God's holy word, if you're able, when you get there? Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. Hear the word of God. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. This is the sublime and wonderful word of God. You may be seated. As we stand at the beginning of a new year, I want to invite us to consider the new covenant. The new covenant in the new year. The new covenant is very important for us to understand. So it's, it's good for every Christian to understand the significance of the new covenant, what it is and what it means. First of all, we ask, well, what is a covenant anyway? Well, a covenant is a solemn vow or promise made before God where two parties are bound together as family. And so those are the three elements of a biblical covenant, promise, God, and family. So we see that a covenant is sort of like a contract, but it's much more than a contract. Because when you sign a contract at work, you don't become family with your boss. It'd be a little weird. And you usually do not make a vow before God when you sign a contract. So a covenant is more than a simple contract. Unlike a contract, a covenant is more like becoming blood brothers. Two main examples of covenants that we have still in our modern day is marriage and adoption. A Christian marriage is a covenant made between a man and a woman, a vow before God that makes the two of them family. In the case of Christian adoption, Parents make a solemn promise to God to bring a child into their family as their own. This is what a covenant is. Promise. God. Family. And when we talk about a new covenant, that implies that there was an old covenant. Throughout the Old Testament, God had made several covenants along the way. God made a covenant with Adam and with Noah and with Abraham. But when we talk about the Old Covenant, we mean the covenant that God instituted through Moses at Mount Sinai. There at that mountain, God brought the nation of Israel into covenant with himself. He will be their God, and they will be his people. They will become family. 
And God promised them blessing and prosperity and goodness if they kept his law and commandments and precepts and rules and statutes. But if they disobeyed his law, then God also promised punishment upon his people. And as we just read from Jeremiah, through the prophet, God had promised to institute a new covenant, a different covenant, a better covenant. It would not be like the old broken covenant. It would be better. It would be different. It would be better because the knowledge and love of God would be imprinted directly upon the hearts of the people of God. And just look at what the Lord Jesus Christ does at the Last Supper. The Last Supper, with his disciples around him, Jesus takes the words of Jeremiah and he applies the promise of the new covenant to his death on the cross. And so Jesus declares in that action that the new and better covenant is here. Listen to these words from the Gospel of Luke chapter 22, at the Last Supper. It says, When the hour came, Jesus reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And you know, every month, when we celebrate communion together, the first Sunday of the month, we hear the new covenant in the record of the Apostle Paul, when he describes this same supper in 1 Corinthians 11. Listen to these words once again. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So the new covenant that was prophesied by the prophet Jeremiah 600 years before has finally been inaugurated by the Messiah based on his suffering and death on the cross. God was signing the new covenant in blood, in the blood of his beloved son. In the new covenant, God was saying, through Jesus Christ, I will be your God, and you will be my son or daughter. We will become family. But as we stand on the edge of this new year, I want us to go back to Jeremiah to study the original promise of the new covenant. And let us see what God had promised back then so that we can more fully appreciate its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. So please look in your Bibles at that passage that we just read together in Jeremiah 31, 31. It says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke Though I was their husband, declares the Lord. Let us stop there for a moment. The book of Jeremiah is set at the worst moment in the history of Israel. It's when Jerusalem is surrounded by the Babylonians and the city is under siege. And it's about to fall when Jeremiah writes 
these things. The city will be destroyed. The temple of the living God built by King Solomon will also be destroyed. The people of Judah are about to go into exile. And this is punishment for all their sin and disobedience against God. They have broken the, their covenant with him. And they have, they have been breaking that covenant for a very long time. But here in verse 31, we see a wonderful ray of hope in all of this darkness. God is going to do something new. And beautiful. He's going to institute a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. This is not only beautiful, it's actually a little bit uh, surprising at this time in history because the house of Israel, which is the northern kingdom, that actually no longer exists. It's been gone for about a hundred years at this point. There is no house of Israel, and yet God has not forgotten about them. He is going to make a new covenant that somehow brings the house of Israel back into relationship with him too. And what may seem impossible to us is not impossible with God. In verse 32, we learn that this new covenant is also going to be a different covenant. It's not going to be like the old covenant made with Mount, at Mount Sinai through Moses. God delivered his people Israel out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and outstretched arm. And then he entered into covenant with her by making her his bride. But we also learn from this verse, verse 32, that the old covenant is a broken covenant. It's a broken marriage because Israel had been disobeying God's law and breaking the covenant all the way along. And this highlights the problem, the problem of sin. God has given a good and perfect law to his people, but because of abiding sin in their hearts, his people simply have no ability to keep his perfectly good law. And actually what the new covenant is going to do is the new covenant is going to get at the root of that very problem. It's going to get at the root of the problem of sin. And that's why it's a better covenant. We see this in the next two verses, verse 33 and verse 34. It says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. It says, I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his brother and each his, and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. And in these, in these verses that describe the new covenant, there are three main elements prophesied here through Jeremiah. And we're going to go through them one by one. The first one is there's this movement from the external to the internal. From what is outside to the inside. That's the first element. The second element is there's this, there's this element of personal relationship. Personal relationship or family that is emphasized here. And thirdly, as we saw at the very end there, there's this idea of complete forgiveness. So the external to the internal, personal relationship is emphasized on the basis of complete forgiveness here. So the first element that we observe here in the New Covenant is this movement from external to internal, from what is on the outside being brought into the inside. We see this with the law of God in verse 33. It says, the law will no longer be external to his people. No longer written on stone tablets for them to read with their eyes. Instead, God is going to write his law directly upon their minds and hearts. That's, that's sort of strange. We, we see that, that symbolic, metaphorical language. But what does that mean? What does that point to? That's pointing to an inward change. God is going to do something. 
to the hearts and the minds of his people so that rather than the law becoming a duty or, or the fear of the wrath of God being central, th their hearts are changed. So now they're, they're eager to keep his law out of genuine love for him. There's going to be an internal change to the heart and to the mind. But that's not the only external to internal movement we observe here. Also in the next verse, verse 34, we see that the knowledge of God, which includes his worship, is going to move from the outside to the inside. In the new covenant, a person will not need to be taught to know God. That person with the law already written on their heart will already know God personally. A person won't need to be exhorted. Hey man, you need to be in a relationship with God. You need to know the Lord. Because that person will reply, No man, I already know the Lord. From the inside out. God is talking about personal and intimate relationship in the new covenant. And this leads us right into the second element we see here. Personal relationship or family in the new covenant. Verse 33, God declares, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. This is a restoration of the broken relationship, broken by sin, hindered by disobedience. The old covenant was broken. The relationship between God as husband and his people as bride was severed. But now, in the new covenant, that relationship is repaired, it's restored, it's renewed in mutual possessiveness. For now God can say of his people, my people, my own, mine, my possession belonging to me. But also in the same way the people of God can say of God, our God, our own, ours, our Abba Father, our King, our Lord, I am my beloved's and he is mine. His banner over me is love. And under the old covenant, God was Israel's God and Israel was his people. That is true, but, but underlying the old covenant was a demand. I am your God, so act like my people. There's a demand there. I am your God, and I demand that you be my people. And people could never live up to that demand. It was just too high. They failed at every turn. But now, in the new covenant, that demand is no longer there. Why? Because God has now implanted relationship into the hearts of his people. And so now he is our God and we are his people without sin breaking that relationship or hindering it in any way. And this leads us into the third element we see here. Complete forgiveness. Complete forgiveness. How can this relationship be truly restored if something isn't done about sin? Because sin was the root problem. Won't God's people just continue breaking the new covenant, just like we did the old covenant as we sin against God? Won't that just continue in this endless cycle? But verse 34 gives this incredible promise that in the new covenant, God will forgive our iniquity and remember our sins no more. The new covenant is characterized by forgiveness. It's not a partial forgiveness or a mostly forgiveness we're talking about here it is complete forgiveness that's what that last phrase is pointing us to the all-knowing God is going to forget he's going to forget our sins God promises that he will not remember our sins this means that he will not hold our sins against us in any way. He's going to treat us like we have never sinned against him. And when the devil accuses us before the Father and tries to remind God 
of our sin against him, our father is going to say, well, what sin? I don't know what you're talking about. I don't remember any sin against me. That's complete forgiveness. Oh, what a beautiful thing the new covenant is. But inquiring minds want to know. How? How, how is this possible? God? How can God do all this? How can he pull this off? And in Jeremiah, God doesn't give us the answer. He doesn't give us the how here. We will have to wait until the Last Supper before we learn the how. When the Lord Jesus takes the cup after supper and says to his disciples, Hey guys, you've been waiting 600 years since Jeremiah to find out how God is going to bring about the new covenant. Well, here it is. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. There's the how. The blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross, his sacrificial death, his substitutionary atonement. That is how God brings complete forgiveness, where he will remember sin no more. There is now no condemnation whatsoever for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8 verse 1, the most glorifying, glorious and terrifying verse in the entire Bible. If I am in Christ Jesus through a faith that unites and binds me to himself, then God looks at me and sees the perfect righteousness of Jesus. He doesn't see my ugliness, my failure, my sin. In Jesus Christ, he's forgotten it all. In Jesus Christ, we enter into personal relationship with God where he is our God and we are his people. In Jesus Christ, what was external moves internal. The law of Christ is now written upon our hearts and minds as we know the Lord our God personally. This is all brought about through Jesus Christ. But you know, the Old Testament has more to say about the New Covenant. We've been talking about the New Covenant in the prophet Jeremiah. We actually learn a little bit more from the prophet Ezekiel, who was prophesying just a few years later after Jeremiah. Now, Ezekiel does not use the same term. He does not say new covenant like Jeremiah did, but God, speaking through Ezekiel, does refer to those same three elements that we have looked at. External to internal, personal relationship, and complete forgiveness. And actually, two places in the book of Ezekiel, the same theme is repeated twice. First in chapter 11, and then chapter 36 of Ezekiel. And if you have your Bibles open, I'd invite you to turn over to Ezekiel, first in chapter 11. It should be the next book in your Bible, so it shouldn't be hard to find. I want you to get your eyes on this so you can appreciate it more. So first listen to what God declares in chapter 11 of Ezekiel. Verse 19. Ezekiel eleven nineteen. God says, I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. That they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules and obey them. And they shall be my people and I will be their God. Do you hear the echoes? Do you hear the echoes of the new covenant from Jeremiah in these words? They shall be my people, and I will be their God. There's personal relationship. They will walk in my statutes and keep my rules and obey them. That implies a restored walk with God and forgiveness. 
And there is an internal work happening here where God will place within his people a focused and undivided heart along with a new spirit. Ah, well, that's a new detail, isn't it? That, that's a new detail that Jeremiah did not mention. Not only a new heart, but Ezekiel says, a new spirit. So the new covenant will be spiritual. It will be a spiritual renewal. God is going to do spiritual open heart transplant surgery on his people. He's going to take out that old stony heart hardened by sin and he's going to replace it with a beating spiritually, spiritual heart, spiritually alive, a heart that delights to worship him in spirit and truth. But this declaration is just too good to say only once. And so again, in chapter 36, if you turn over there, in Ezekiel, God says it all over again. But now he's speaking directly to his people. In Ezekiel 36, verse 25 to 28, God repeats himself again here, and he says now, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. From all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. And you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. And you shall be my people. And I will be your God. This is largely the same as back in chapter 11. But there is another new major detail here. Because here God specifies what kind of new spirit he will place in the hearts of his people. It's not just any old spirit. It's his very own spirit, he said. The spirit of the living God. He says, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. God is promising to indwell the Holy Spirit in his people as part of the new covenant. The Holy Spirit will come upon the people of God on the day of Pentecost to take up residence and live inside every genuine believer in Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 to 20, the Apostle Paul says this, listen, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit whom you receive from God? The promised Holy Spirit indwells his people in order to produce holiness in us. When the Holy Spirit lives and abides in us, he is conforming us to the image of Christ and Christ obeys his heavenly Father. So the Holy Spirit is conforming us heart, mind, and soul to God himself. He is bringing into alignment our morality with God's morality, our will with God's will, our heart with God's heart. And so as the Holy Spirit does his work within us, we ought to be growing in the morality of God found in his holy law. That we walk in his statutes and are careful to obey his rules. Remember he said, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols I will cleanse you. The clean water that God sprinkles on us to cleanse us in his sight is not actually water. But instead it is the precious blood of the Lamb of God that washes away sin. In Christ we are clean and pure in God's eyes. All our idols and all our idolatries are washed away. This is 
the new covenant. Promised by God through the, pro the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel and fulfilled in the cross of Jesus Christ and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the church. And as we stand at the beginning of this new year, it is important for us, every one of us, to understand our status before God. Through Christ, we are in a new covenant with God. A new family relationship with God. Adopted as his sons and daughters. It is a better covenant, a superior covenant, because the promises are better. And the foundation is not the blood of bulls and goats and sheep, but rather it's the blood of the Son of God. In this new covenant, God has brought his holy law from outside of, our, outside of us into our minds and hearts by the Holy Spirit. He has regenerated us by changing our hearts. He's taken that, uh, that stony heart out and replaced it with a beating heart of flesh. Now we know the Lord in personal relationship. We are His, and He is ours. He has forgiven us completely, separating our, us from our sins as far as the east is from the west. Our sins have been drowned in Christ's blood. There is no condemnation whatsoever for those who are in Christ Jesus. But how does knowing this this status that we have in the new covenant, how is that going to affect you this new year? Are you going to continue walking in the drudgery and the grayness and the burden of the old covenant with its demands and accusations that cannot bring life? Or are you going to walk in the joy and vitality of the new covenant, the new covenant of grace drenched in the blood of Jesus Christ? For the law of Christ is written on your heart where you know the Lord and walk humbly with your God, where you rejoice that your sins are completely forgiven and forgotten by God, that no condemnation is hanging over you if you are in Christ. Let the promise and the fulfillment of the new covenant seep into every area of your life. Let the new covenant grab hold of your mind and captivate your heart. Look at the world with new covenant eyes and hear everything with new covenant ears. Let your worship be seasoned with new covenant flavor as you taste and see that the Lord is good. Let your work life be new covenantal and your home life be new covenantal. How you think, how you talk, how you reason, what choices you make, where you go, what you do. Let all of these things be filtered through the new covenant. And if you do, you will begin to see new life, new growth, new hope, new peace arising in your daily walk with the Lord. And why is that? Because the new covenant enables us to take off our eyes from ourselves and off of the world around us. And it fixes our eyes on Christ alone and the beauty of our wonderful God. Let us pray together. Father, we are so grateful for the new covenant it was not a contingency plan. It was not a band-aid solution. It was not something that you suddenly came up with. No, it was, it was the plan all the way along. That you prophesied through the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel 600 years before the advent of Christ. You, you said that you were going to do something new. You were going to bring a new covenant, not like the old covenant that was broken. Not because there was anything wrong with it, but because there was everything wrong with us. But you promised to make all things new. To start with a new covenant, this new relationship that you were going to form on the basis of the blood of the Messiah shed for his people. And Father, the, the children of Israel had to wait 600 long years before that fulfillment would be seen. And, and so many of the people of Israel 
rejected their Messiah when he did come. But Father, we are so glad that he, the, the Lord didn't come just for the Jewish people, but also for Gentiles. That he has torn down that dividing wall of hostility. That in Christ we can be one, one with each other and one with him. Hmm. That in the new covenant, you bring what is external, the law, you bring it inside and you write it on our hearts so that it is a joy to walk in your ways. It is a joy to love you and to know you and to desire every good thing from your hand because you are our only portion in this land of the living. Father, you have brought us into true relationship with yourself through Jesus Christ. That if we are in you, or rather, if we are in Christ, our relationship with you is restored. It's made right. We have peace with you. Because of that complete forgiveness that Jesus has brought for us. So we don't have to fear condemnation. We don't have to fear punishment. We deserve it, but we don't have to fear it anymore. If we are in Christ. And so, Father, give us minds to understand. Give us ears to hear. Give us eyes to see these things. That in Christ, the new covenant is fulfilled. It's inaugurated. It's here. And as believers, we get to walk in that truth. We get to walk in the fulfilled promise that you have made. That truly, you have forgotten our sins. You do not remember them anymore. Which means you will not use them against us. For God, of course, you know all things. and You, you forget nothing. You remember all things. But when you say that you will not remember our sins anymore, that means you will not use them against us. But the condemnation has been satisfied. Justice has been met. Your wrath has been quenched. So that now all you, you see when you look at us is truth and righteousness and goodness and perfection. Not that any of that belongs to us, but it's because we're in Christ. And He is everything that we could not be. So Father, I do pray for all of this. As much as I pray for myself personally, for my family, for those close to me, I pray for all of us, Father. That each and every one of us here today would desire to walk in the light of the new covenant. To truly grasp on to what that means, what you have promised, and what you have fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And may that begin to change everything in our lives as we correct our vision, as we align our hearts and minds to your heart and mind. This would bring growth and, and vitality into our lives as we walk with you. Father, all the praise and the glory and the honor belongs to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.